Although you root you if it's ensuring a safe exploitation of space. Okay, I'll leave here. In the, in the folder uh, we have distributed this morning, you could find uh, a fact sheet of, of these kind of technologies. This is not uh, a technical uh, explanation, but at least it's just uh, the, the basic uh, elements uh, for uh, commercial uh, elements, uh, for market demands, market potential, competitive advantages, and so on. Huh? This, we are preparing at uh, this moment uh, more facts like that uh, for the different technology we have at the university. Then, you have the floor. All right, thank you very much. To begin with, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the chance to be here with you today. It's a privilege for me. And this being said, let's talk about the near future. Probably most of the people here in this room had the chance to see the movie Gravity. It was a blockbuster winning seven Academy Awards. What is most, what is most important about the movie is that it made people all over the world aware of the severity of the space debris problem. Because it might seem like a science fiction <coughs> issue, but it's not. It's a very real threat for the safe exploitation of space. In the past years, the population of space debris has been growing increasingly fast. This happens because we launch satellites into space, and once we are done using them, instead of bringing them back to Earth, we just leave them there, because it's cheaper to do so. The problem is that, as a consequence, all commercial interest in orbits are totally crowded. There is no more room up there, literally. And still, we keep launching new satellites and play Tetris with them, try to make them fit into the same orbit without crashing against each other. Currently, there are about 6,000 tons of space debris floating around the Earth. And this, obviously, endangers the safe and profitable exploitation of space. And what's more, there are so many objects up there that eventually they crash against each other. There are collisions happening all the time among space debris. But nowadays, on an average of one collision every 10 years happens involving an operational satellite. This is kind of catastrophic when it happens. After each collision, thousands of tiny new fragments of space debris are created. Each of these fragments could cause further collisions and so on, eventually leading to a snowball effect that could render all commercial interest in orbits totally unusable. This is known as the Kessler syndrome, and we are pretty close of getting to that point of no return if we haven't already. There is no need to say that space business, space business moves a lot of money, just to give a few numbers. For the next decade, there are going to be like about 1,000 new satellites launched into space with an estimated cost of 150 billion euros. Each time there is a collision involving an operational satellite, the losses could be as high as several hundreds of millions of euros. What's more, even if we decided from this day on, let's not launch any new satellite into space because we are very concerned about keeping space clean. It doesn't really matter. It's already too late. There are so many objects that due to the collisions among them, the space debris population will keep on steadily increasing. And this threat could even be lethal for astronauts and future crewed space missions. Now, the question is, is there anything we could do about this? Space agencies are already looking for the commitment of governments and space operators that everything they launch into space, they will have to bring them back to Earth or take them away from there in a reasonable time. However, what happens with all the space debris that is already up there in space? We like it or not, sooner or later, we will have to deal with this issue. We will have to go up there and remove at least the most dangerous objects. This is referred to as active space debris removal. Several methods or concepts have been proposed for this goal. We could mention robotic arms, nets, harpoons, electrostatic repulsion, laser beams. There's a handful of them. The method we proposed is the ion beam shepherd concept. It basically consists on using ion beams or plasma beams in order to interact with objects in the space to move them or push them away. 
Compared to the previously mentioned methods, ours has plenty of advantages. For instance, it's contactless. If there is no need for a physical contact with the debris, it's obviously much safer from an operational point of view. Also, we are far more efficient than other methods. This means that we are going to be less expensive than other methods. And um, maybe best of all, the concept is totally based on mature technologies that are already used in space every day and they are space certified. The concept is patent protected by the Technical University of Madrid. The little inconvenient we might find is that the Ion Beam Shopper concept involves some expertise or knowledge of many very different areas of knowledge, ranging from orbital mechanics to plasma physics. Now, the good thing is, luckily, between our research group, the Space Dynamics Group, along with the collaboration we did with the Space Propulsion and Plasma team, we were able to cover all these areas of knowledge. And what we did was to take all this knowledge and pack it into a piece of software, the IBIS. Ion Beam Interaction Software. This is the software we are presenting today, plainly speaking, the one we are selling. <laughs> now, what's the point of such a simulation tool? What, what's it aimed for? It's very simple. If anyone ever is going to design a space mission involving an Ion Beam Shepard, it is totally essential to have such a simulation tool. There's no other way. You need one. What is our competitive advantage. Mainly, what a better advantage than being the only single piece of software in the whole world with these features. It's the only one that does what this piece of software does. And besides, ours is endorsed by the experience of over 20 years of experience in the Technical University of Madrid in all these fields. About the software, the core of the software, mathematical core, is practically done. There are just a few minor details pending. The algorithms, most of them are published, but however, there are some key aspects that have remained in secret as know-how of our internal, as internal know-how of our group. They have never been revealed. And the software is currently in register process. Now you might be thinking, but who in this planet might even remotely be interested in such a simulation tool? Well, you are very right. We don't have such a big possibility of potential clients. We might be thinking of space agencies, some aerospace companies, and eventually maybe some research group, but that's all. So in our, in our opinion, this suggests a per client approach. Just go to their door, knock on the door, and ask something like, excuse me, are you, by the way, working in active space debris removal? <laughs> yes, we are. Oh, in that case, we have something that you might find extremely interesting. That's a plan, maybe not the best plan. <laughs> a bad plan is better than none at all, they used to say. So, to wrap up, just a reminder of who we are. We are the Space Dynamics Group of the Technical University of Madrid and the Space Propulsion and Plasma Team. In recent years, in aspects related to the Ion Beam Shepard, we had the chance to collaborate with several institutions and big companies with big names. In the aerospace uh, community, we could mention the uh, European Space Agency, CENER, DEMOS, DLR, and so on. And as a proof of the existing interest in active space debris removal, and more precisely, in our concept, we have received in the present years funding from both the European Space Agency and the European Committee to perform three big research projects. Some of them are still ongoing. And this is everything I wanted to share with you this morning. If you have any question, I would try to, to give an answer if I can. Thank you. Do you have any, any question? Yes, please. Uh, micro is coming. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's just a question about who pays to remove the junk? I mean, it's really worth doing, but how do you assign the costs? Today? Yeah, no, I mean, who... No who, one's paying. Uh, no, but how would you assign the costs? I mean, everybody benefits, but... Exactly everybody benefits, and no one is doing it because they don't consider the problem is big enough already to do something about it. The problem is that 
it might happen that it is already too late. Just we don't know if we reach the Kessler syndrome or not. We just would need to wait like several decades and see if the observations of the growth of the space debris population is according to uh, exponentially growing or not. So nowadays everybody's like looking another way, not doing anything. But is there a treaty or a, some mm, kind of negotiation process? Right now, the only thing that there is is some kind of recommended practice, it's not even mandatory, that every new launch has to be, should be, deorbited in within 25 years. But that's all that there is. It's not even clear whose responsibility it is each time there is a collision. Like, for instance, the latest collision that happened in orbit like a couple of years ago between a Cosmos and Iridium probes, uh, I think one was uh, um, Russian, the other was American. And who paid? Who was responsible? No one paid. They are just like, I mean, imagine what the Russians would say. Oh, so you Americans now, you don't have a shuttle. So you are using our rockets to get up to the space, International Space Station. So at the end, right at, today, as the problem is not yet too big, in their opinion, they kind of negotiate by putting other things on the table. And still no one paid. It's not clear even legally whose responsibility it is. Is it responsibility of the country who launched the, the satellite, who used the, the launcher or the rocket to put it into space, the operator, the one who put the money, the investment on the satellite? It's not clear at all. There's like a legal gap that, well, as I said, everybody's looking at another side and crossing the fingers that. I was wondering if, if yes. insurance companies could be also interested because at the end uh, they need to preserve uh, the, the operation of commercial satellites, etc. No, for a long time. Then, mm. then I don't know because uh, everyone is obliged new, to have an insurance. In yeah. Everything you launch into space has to be assured, uh, ins uh, insurance. Uh, I only can, can give some numbers. Like for instance, in geostationary orbit. We know, we find in Google, it's there available, that the Alliance Insurance Company, I think they had, maybe the numbers are not accurate, but we can Google it. I think they had like 10 satellites in geostationary orbit. Those satellites tend to be very expensive. And the total overall cost of assuring per every year, those satellites, I think it's like about 40 million euros. So it's huge, because everything that could happen there, it's a great economical loss for everybody. And it's a concern, but... Uh, I have another question there. Yes. Uh, does your technology avoid uh, the collision? or Because I understood that it just moved away the debris, but it didn't actually take it away. It was just moving it further. Yeah, we are not uh, focused on collision avoidance maneuvers. That is what, mm, currently, it is being done. Like we are detecting that in one week from today, there's going to be a collision. So one of the objects has to move. What's the problem? The problem is that if your satellite is operational and you have fuel, you have control on the satellite, you could perform a maneuver. However, if you detect that two big objects are going to collide and both of them are dead, like you have no fuel, you have no control, nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. There's probably the most dangerous piece of space debris right now belongs to Europe. It's the Envisat satellite. It's like a monster. It's like from this wall to that wall in size, like close to 10 tons in size. And it's, it's totally out of control. They lost control. They don't know why. And it's been like that for uh, close to two years. And they are very concerned that they should do something to remove that piece, because it's in a very critical orbit, very crowded. And no, we don't do colli uh, collision avoidance maneuvers. But uh, as we can push objects, we, can, we could be pushing them for several months because we exert a very small force, but very cheaply. OK, like, but um, you're not removing the debris. You're just moving it away. If we push for long enough, we could lower their orbit so that due to atmospheric drag, they would re-enter in a few years. So we would actually remove them out of space. Or in worst case, we could uh, put them into a higher orbit. There are some orbits called as symmetry orbits because they are safe, they are stable, and the object could stay there for several centuries without harming anyone. So we have the capability of doing both things. So we could actually, yes, deorbit, like uh, literally remove the object from space. It's just a matter of time, how long you are pushing. But we can. OK. Yes, please. Who is paying for your patent? You must 
with uh, it's the not United it's States? not yet we began with a national patent it was the technical university of madrid who paid for it okay. and we didn't go for an international patent because it was not evident at the time that there was going to be any immediate commercial interest to cope for the money investment. But one of the companies we've been collaborating with, Sener, I might say the name, they showed a great interest in buying the patent and extending them internationally. But finally, after carefully reading the small letters in the contract, <laughs> they saw some possibility of circumventing the patent and they said, this might be a little bit risky to put that much money in it. But they did have the interest. And Sener is one, one of the companies like pushing with more seriousness towards carrying a real demonstration space mission to demonstrate the use of the Iomim Shepard. You keep hope of getting that paid? You keep your hope of getting that paid? Uh, when the time comes, I don't know. If our concept is the chosen one, but of course, someone that would put into practice such an orbit demonstration mission would need to be a big space agency. If uh, ESA takes our project, they will have the money for sure to do that. But then there's politics into the game too. Thank you. Anyway, space debris is one of the, of the high priorities for the Horizon 2020 in the space part. Uh, that this is not, uh, is not a marginal a problem at this moment in Europe. Uh, anyway, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much again.